Islam. I'm Dr. Aline Bay, Grand Sheikh of the Moorish Holy Temple of Science of the World. And today we're going to share with you some powerful information that you might not have known. Here in St. Louis, Missouri, and one of the last slave states, as a matter of fact. And according to Judge Taney, um, the Dred Scott case, or what's called Dred Scott versus Sanford, um, 60 United States 393-1856, Judge Taney um, stated that a free Negro of the African race whose ancestry was bought to this country and sold as slaves is not a citizen within the means of the Constitution of the United States. With the Constitution, when the Constitution was adopted, they were not regarded in any of the states as members of the community, which constitutes the state and were not numbered among its people or citizens. Consequently, the special rights and immunities granted to citizens do not apply to them. Now, of course, this was an opinion. However, what is not stated is that in 1848, another case took place in which that was dealing with the heirs of Turner versus the United States, as well as also Henry Turner versus the United States. In both of these particular cases, it is stated that the indigenous people of this land, also referred to as Washita, um, were the rightful heirs of what is known as the Louisiana proper, or also known as, um, misnomer as, the Louisiana Purchase. So this was done in 1848. So therefore, uh, what we found out is that Judge Taney also gave the ruling in that case. So what was the difference in these two, in these, um, two cases particularly uh, between um, Henry Turner or the heirs of Henry Turner versus the United States and the Dred Scott case or the Dred Scott versus Sanford? What was the difference in these two cases? Well, what happened is that we found out that one had nationality and status as compared to another. The one that was in 1848 had nationality and status, who was known as the Turner called Washita families, the tribes, as compared to Dred Scott, who did not have nationality and status. All right, so that is the difference between the two cases in which that we're going to speak about today, as well as also going to more information. Now, what we will find out is that the Dred Scott case stated those who were free Negroes. Now, you got to understand is that there was um, said blacks who, were no, who was named Moors who was already here prior to the enslavement in which that took place 400 years ago. All right? And this is actually verified by Christopher Columbus in his um, diaries in which that he stated that when he came to the shores of the West Indies, in particular, I think it was Cuba, not only was there a mosque on top of the hill, but also that he was greeted by an emperor who spoke Hebrew, Arabic, and Chaldean, which are Eastern languages, Semitic languages that I might add, but yet it was spoken here in the Western Hemisphere. And also you will find out that the Omex, according to history, they are um, misnomed as Native Americans, but they were the first moderate inhabitants of civilization here in the Western Hemisphere. My wife and I went to Mexico um, some years ago, and we asked the tour guide about the Omex, and he said that they are the mothers of civilization. However, we do not know too much about them. We questioned about him not knowing too much about them as if he just waved off the question in which that we was asking, and he went to stating, however, are there other questions? Well, the problem with that was is that there was, there was a lot of information out at that time about the Omex or the Omecas. As a matter of fact, while we was in Mexico, we actually came upon a remnant of the Omex. The people resided in Mexico, in particular in Cancun area of Mexico, which is near um, Chesenisa, Cabal, and Tulum, in those particular areas, which is those sacred pyramid sites. So, um, the Omex are still there, as well as the Mayan people. All of them did not disappear, as um, the History Channel might 
um, have you to presume that they did. So, um, let's get into today's discussion even further. We will see that when we get into the 14th Amendment, which is supposed to have been the amendment in which that made us citizens of the United States, in particular, the so-called um, slaves or POWs, prisoners of war, that they supposed to have become citizens based on the 14th Amendment, um, even though this opinion of the Dred Scott case still stood. And supposedly what um, negated the Dred Scott decision was the 14th Amendment. However, what we found out is that the joint resolution proposed the said amendment and it was not submitted to or adopted by the Constitutional Congress per Article 1, Section 3 and Article 5 of the United States Constitution. It was never submitted to the President for his approval as required by Article 1, Section 7 of the, of the United States Constitution. The proposed 14th Amendment was rejected by more than one-fourth of all the states then in the Union, and it was never ratified by three-fourths of all the states in the Union, as required by Article 5 of the United States Constitution. Fifteen states out of the 37 states of the Union rejected the proposal, um, or the proposed 14th Amendment, and between the dates of its submission to the states by the Secretary of State on June 16, 1866, and March 24, 1868, thereby fully nullifying said resolution and making it impossible for its ratification by the um, constitutional requirement of three-fourths of such states. Now, let's go through the states in which that rejected the proposal of the 14th Amendment. Texas, October the 27th, 1866. Georgia, November the 9th, 1866. Florida, December the 6th, 1866. Alabama, December the 7th, 1866. Arkansas, December the 17th, 1866. Kentucky, January the 8th, 1867. Virginia, January the 8th, um, excuse me, January the 9th, 1867. Louisiana, February the 6th, 1867. Delaware, February the 7th, 1867. Maryland, March the 23rd, 1867. Mississippi, January the 31st, 1867. Ohio, January the 16th, 1868. New Jersey, March the 24th, 1868. South Carolina, December the 20th, 1866. And even North Carolina, December the 14th, 1866. In all 15 states rejected the 14th Amendment. And it was never brought forth before the now 50 said states in the Union. In other words, it was never brought forth in order for it to be ratified by the rest of the states, nor to be put forth by even these states again for those who rejected it. So that means that it was never passed in any shape, form, or fashion. It's been an illusion. And therefore, that means that the Dred Scott case still stands. And if the Dred Scott case still stands, then that means that, in a sense, we are not United States citizens. And if we're not United States citizens, then who and what are we? Well, according to the last broadcast and broadcasts, you will find out that we are the indigenous aboriginal people of North America. Because when you go and study the Omex, the Omex not just did not dwell or live in um, or domicile, as we would say, in South America, in Central America, or in um, Mexico, but they came up into the interior of Mississippi, um, the Mississippi Valley, and spread it out throughout the south, the eastern seaboard, and the northern portion all the way up into Canada. So therefore, um, we are the descendants of the Omex. And the Omex was already here in the Western Hemisphere over 5,000 years ago. This is historical fact. You can get the book of African presence in um, in the Americas by Ivan von Sertima, as well as many other authors. Now, that means if we have no tie of nationality, what is the means of us defining ourselves? Because if we're not defined as a United States citizen, 
That means we must define ourselves. And the United Nations give us the ability in order to now define ourselves. And it's actually a God-given right in which that we have according to the Constitution anyway, in which that we are born with unalienable rights, unalienable rights. However, um, when you read Brother Taj Tariq Bey's book, um, Who of the Moorish Americans Moors Defined, the truth is these problems, which is a lack of self-esteem, a lack of jobs, a lack of education, and other seemingly related issues and or disciplines, are the symptoms not the root cause of oppression and the denial of citizen rights of the Union States um, society jurisdiction. The following are the major root causes of the above stated problem. A lack of knowledge of self which ties to parentage. A lack of birthright, self-authority, and heritage, land and resources due to death by foreign and alien European colonial incorporated companies which are corporations slash now states is that we talk about being autonomous, all right, um, and being able to self-define and have self-determination due to theft of birthrights as lack of constitution, language originating from self for national and international protections of sovereign citizen rights and immunities, a lack of enough honest and knowledgeable, true, de jure representation of the people branded as black who are willing to admit to and tell these truths rather than capitalize on the profitable social and political opportunities open due to these civic wounds. A commonly held attitude of cultivating weak and sluggish will when the pressures of work, finance, and sacrifice becomes evident to bring true de jure law and a teaching of sovereign capacity to the stage of reality. This weak tendency may must be reversed with priorities clarified by proper civic instructions. Above all, before any people can be recognized by the international community of nations, publicly declare your nationality. For this point, the rights and freedom solving process begins. So when we're talking about sovereignty, we're not talking about the said white sovereign citizens as they call themselves, because the Moors have nothing to do with that. We're talking about in terms of international affairs and the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, in which that states that Indigenous people have the right to self-autonomy and self-government. Now, for those who are black, or said to be, or said to be black, um, it is amazing that within the last 100 years that we are the only people on the planet Earth that have changed our names at least four different occasions or has changed our names on documents and forms that is published by the United States, by the government, on four different occasions. In the 1900s, we was referred to as Negro. By 1930, we became colored. By 1960, we was black. By 1990, we was African American. Now, same bloodline, same lineage, if I go back and check my mother's, guess what it says on our birth certificate? Negro. Go back and check my grandmother's, it says Negro. Alright, check mine's, it has black. Now there are um, birth certificates coming out that saying African American. But the point is, is that when we go back and check these birth certificates, even though you was born from the same people, it has all four different names from this generation in which that is being born, my generation, my mother's generation, and my grandmother's and then great-grandmother's generation. How is that possible that you have four different names for one people? That is not possible. And what we mean by it's not possible is that what I'm saying is that it has no land tie and no nationality concerning it whatsoever. When we go to Black's Law Dictionary, we go to the word Negro. Let's look it up. It says the word Negro means a black man who's descended from an African race and does not commonly include a mulatto. Felix versus State 18 Alabama 720. But the laws of the different states are not uniform in this respect. Some include in the description Negro one who has one eighth or more of African blood. And then it says the term Negro means necessarily person of color, but not every person of color is Negro. Rice versus Golong. 
139 Mississippi 760 104 um, um, SO, which is South Carolina 105 uh, 109. Now, so here it is within this definition of Negro, it had the word African, it had the word colored, it has the word um, mulatto, or don't include mulatto. But the thing is, is that these are all artificial labels. These are all artificial terms. These are adjectives. They describe a thing, but a proper noun is a person, place, a thing according to grammar. Proper English grammar, a proper noun is a person, place, or thing. These are descriptive. Therefore, it's an adjective according to English grammar. Let's look up the word black person. Black person, according in constitution and law, may be taken in its generic sense as contradiction from white. Now, it says in its generic sense. That means it's not specified. So black person is not specified. It's not a specific name. It's generic. Once again, it's a description. Because of, according to Black Store Dictionary, the word person can also be a natural person or it can be also in reference to an artificial person, which is a corporation. Let's go to the word colored, which is also in Black Store Dictionary 4th edition. It says, by common usage in America, this term in such phrases as colored person, the colored race, the colored men, and the like is used to designate Negroes. All persons of African race, including all persons of mixed blood descended from Negro ancestry. Collins versus Oklahoma State Hospital, 760 Oklahoma 229. And but where a state constitution provides for separate schools for white and colored races, the term white race was held to be limited to Caucasian race and the term colored race to embrace all other races. This is race um, rice versus golem. 139 Mississippi 760. Then it goes on to say it has also been held that there is no legal technical signification to the phrase colored person which the courts are bound judicially to know. This is um, Powell Scott versus Dallas 31 Texas 74. So that means when we use the word colored that is not even a legal technical significance in law. It has no legal te um, technical significance. That the court is bound judicially to know. The courts can't recognize it. Because, once again, it's a description. It's an adjective. So the word Negro, Black, and Colored are adjectives. And when you use these adjectives, you are what is called civilitis mortus, according to the Black's Law Dictionary. It says, civilly dead, dead in the view of the law, the conditions of one who has lost his civil rights and capacities and is accounted dead in law. Razor versus Razor, 173, South Carolina, 365, 175. All right, so we don't want to be dead in the eyes of the law, even civically. What we want to be is in full life, which according to Black's Law Dictionary, which means continue in both physical and civil existence. That is neither actually dead nor civilis mortus. All right, this is page um, 895, Black's Law Dictionary, 4th Deluxe Edition. Now, not only that, we want to have a land tie. So the word more is tied back to land. That means as the most indigenous people on the planet and the first people and the first inhabitants on the planet, um, the word more would fit all of us who has this indigenous um, connection to the land. Um, in other words, it gives us a better definition, a more specific definition than all these generic adjectives in which that is being used. When you read the word land in Black's Law Dictionary, it reads, in the general sense, comprehended any ground, soil, or earth whatsoever, as fields, meadows, postures, woods, moors, M-O-O-R-S, moors, waters, marshes, um, furses and heaths. All right, this is um, Rayner versus City of Cottowell. All right, so when you use the word moors or more, it ties you instantly back to the land. That means back to all 196, what, 1,493,400,000 um, 
square footage of land on the planet Earth. It ties you right back to that, so as being the original inhabitants. Now, you can also go to the Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition, and it gives you a definition of the word more also, M-O-O-R, in which that specifically states that a more is an officer of the court who summons the court for several shreddings and is as equal to 100 bailiffs, bailiffs or sheriffs, um, in the English terminology, in the English law. So when you read these particular definitions, you have to make sure that you understand what is going on and how your birthright has been asserted as a said black person. Now, there's a following excerpt, um, um, following text in which that comes from the Executive Order 11490, October the 19th, 1969, which is known as the King Alfred Plan, the Rex 84, as this became known as. What is said is this. This memo is being submitted in lieu of a full report by the Joint Chief of Staff. That report is now in preparation. There will be many cities with the minorities, and we are referred to as minorities, because the word minority, according to Black's Law Dictionary, means infantile mind. Infantile mind. All right? A minor means someone who is not mature and infantile in the mind. And the minorities will be able to put into the streets a superior number of people who are desperately and dangerous will. This is after um, the 1960s riots in which that this came about. But one of the things in which that they spoke about is that he will be a formidable enemy for he is bound to this continent by heritage. And he knows that political asylum would not be available to him in other countries. All right, it says the greatest concentration of minorities in the Deep South, the Eastern Seaboard, the Great Lake region, and the West Coast. This is where all of the descendants of the Omex, Native Americans, as they are misnomed, um, spread it out through, in other words, the Moors. All right, but it says that we are bound to this continent by heritage. When you look up the word heritage, according to Black's Law Dictionary, it states in civil law, every species of immovable, which can be subject of property, such as land, houses, orchards, woods, marshes, ponds, etc., in whatever mode they may be, um, have been required either by descent or purchase. Now, you go to the uh, Webster Dictionary. Heritage means property that is and can be inherited. Something handed down from one ancestor or the past as characteristic a culture, tradition, etc. The right, burden, and status result from being born in a certain time or place. A birthright. All right, this is Webster New Universal Underbridge Dictionary. So, where did that heritage come from? Well, according to the Holy Quran Circle 7 of the Moral Science Temple of America, um, in the chapter of Egypt, the capital empire of the Dominion of Africa, it states in six verse, the Moabites from the land of Moab, who received permission from the Pharaoh of Egypt to settle and inhibit Northwest Africa, they were the founders and the true possessors of the present Moroccan Empire. Now you understand is that Morocco um, that they're referring to is the empire, not the kingdom of Morocco, which is in just um, Africa. But uh, you have what is known as the Songhai Empire, the Ghanaian Empire, all right, which is here in the Western Hemisphere. This is what they actually were referring to, and this is also within the diary of Christopher Columbus and his son, in which that he speaks about um, seeing um, the Moors travel back and forth across the ocean um, between the West and the East. And it goes on, with their Canaanite, Hittite, and Amorite brethren who sojourned from the land of Canaan seeking new homes. 7. Their dominion and inhabitation extended from northeast and southwest Africa across the Great Atlantis even into the present North, South, and Central America and also Mexico and the Atlantis Islands. Here, chaos or community. He states, we are approaching areas where the voice of the Constitution is not clear. And these are the voices in which that we have spoken about earlier in this presentation. We have left the realm of constitutional rights and we are entering the area of human rights. All right? We are entering the area of human rights. Malcolm X speaks on the civil rights versus human rights in which that he states, human rights comes before civil rights. You can never get civil rights until you have human rights. Human rights represents the right to be human beings. Whenever you are respected and recognized as a human being, your civil rights are automatic. No, 
you have to get recognition as human rights first. Then Constitution, which classifies our people as three-fifths of a man, which meant subhuman, not a complete human being. And once our human characteristics was completely destroyed, this gave them justification for treating us like we were animals. Then it also justified them selling us. If the black man's human rights were respected, he never could have been a slave here in America. And if his human rights has been restored by the Emancipation Proclamation automatically, we would have been citizens after the Civil War. So we must be regarded as human. Our human rights must be respected before we can ever be regarded as citizens and our civil rights be respected. So as you see, there is nothing in which that the morals are doing in which that is out of bounds with international law. And international law, such as this United Nations Declaration of Rights Indigenous Pe um, of People, is actually a treaty in which that Obama, President Obama, actually signed a couple of years ago. So therefore, the United States now has to recognize um, these treaties or this international law. Thank you for watching this episode, and we will continue on with more information concerning your history and heritage. Thank you. Peace. Peace.